the entire world lies quietly at peace. The whole mission has been completed. And in reporting this to you, the people, I speak while the thousands of silent lips forever still among the jungles and the beaches and in the deep waters of the Pacific which mark the way. I speak for the unnamed brave millions homeward bound to take up the challenge of that future which they did so much to salvage from the brink of disaster. As uplifting as the tones and words of General MacArthur were for the United States and its allies, the Japanese representatives on board that day were moved as well. When you have a free moment, take the time to read the message written by Tosh Toshikazu Hasase, a delegate for Japan following the surrender ceremony. And especially, I want to call your attention to a couple sentences from Mr. Kase in which he stated, the day will come when recorded time age upon age will seem but a point in retrospect. However, happen what may in the future, this day on the Missouri will stand out as a bright point that marks a tireless march towards an enduring peace. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here today to honor the anniversary of that peace. Our eternal thanks go to the courageous soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, Coast Guard men, and merchant Marines who served America with distinction and honor, and makes this day possible. I would especially like to re represent all veterans here today who were present on board the USS Missouri on September 2nd, 1945, and I think we have two today. Would they please stand and be recognized? A three. Four. Always is a pleasure to see Art Albert, who carries shrapnel from that attack on uh, April 11, 1945, in his leg, and his wife, who made me my tie today. <laughs> Here to introduce a special guest to speak on behalf of the family of Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz is a founding member of our board and retired captain of the United States Navy, whose family was very close to Admiral Nimitz. Please welcome Captain Michael A. Lilly. Thank you, Mike. I met Admiral Nimitz when I was too young to remember. But he was the handsome gentleman in the photographs in my family's wall and the albums. And you probably can't see this one, but this one was taken at Muli Y, where the uniform of the day was shorts. And Admiral Nimitz is there with my two older sisters, which were five and seven at the time, crawling all over him. And in the background is Admiral Hart who conducted the Hart investigation of Pearl Harbor. And on the, this one is one Kailua Beach with my sisters and Admiral Nimitz. When I mentioned this to my sister Sheila last week, she said, you know, he had the little stub uh, on his ring finger, which he lost in an accident. And every weekend as we went home in the back seat of the car, he would pre pretend to take that finger off, or whisk it off in some sort of a magical way. And Chet told me that was a trick of his as uh, everyone was growing up. My grandparents and Fleet Admiral Nimitz, my grandparents were Henry Walker, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Henry Walker Sr., they were close friends. And my grandmother's wartime diary records that they were together almost every other day, uh, alternated dinners between Nu'uanu and 37 Makalapa almost every other day. And every weekend they were out at Muli Wai, my family's beach home, which was in those photographs. Potter describes it thusly in the book Nimitz. One of Nimitz's favorite means of relaxation was his Saturday visit with his dear friends, the Alexander Walkers, who had a vacation home on the far side of Oahu. Nimitz brought along another officer and usually took Lamar, his flag lieutenant, and Spruance, who was his chief of staff at the time. They put on shorts and aloha shirts, had a steak dinner, listened to symphonies while watching the stars come over the horizon. The conversation might be about anything. Orchids, trivia, only war and military problems were taboo. 
Nimitz's first introduction to Muli Wai was shortly after he arrived here. My grandfather, late 41, went out to Muli Wai, put on a bathing suit, decided to take a swim on his beach, and he found nine rows of barbed wire. And he started down through the barbed wire, and suddenly a guard popped up with a gun, and he said, Halt, this is off limits. And he said, this is my beach, I'm going swimming. He said, no, this is off limits, you're not allowed down here. He says, well, we'll see about that. He called up Chester Nimitz and he said, Chester, would you like to spend the weekend at Muli Wai? <laughs> I'd love it. He drove out that Saturday and my grandfather says, Chester, would you like a swim? He said, yes, I would love it. So they donned their bathing suits and started down through the barbed wire and suddenly the guard pops up, halt. This is off limits. And he looked at Nimitz, who was recognizable, the white-haired gentleman, everybody knew Nimitz, and Nimitz said, this is Walker's Beach, and he's allowed to swim here any time he wants. <laughs> and so for the rest of the war, my grandparents were able to swim at their beach, of course, with Nimitz in tow uh, very frequently. Nimitz's quiet time with my grandparents and friends helped him handle the extreme pressures of his job. He commanded the largest forces ever assembled in the history of the world. Two and a half million service members covering 65 million square miles of ocean and islands. His was a pressure cooker job and time with friends such as my grandparents became one of his safety valves. Just prior to the surrender, my grandmother wrote the following, just a little excerpt to Nimitz's wife, Catherine. The men of Hawaii have watched the progress of the war and have seen the Navy under the brilliant leadership of your fleet admiral, winning the Battle of the Pacific. There is probably more important work for him to do now that the war is won. And with his usual modesty and fine view of everything, he is ready, already endeavoring to promote the common good for all. Mrs. Nimitz responded, we are proud of Chester. His strength and stability played a major part in winning the war. As I look back through the years and remember how much study he put into the subject of battles on land and sea and strategy and how he always made himself familiar with the terrain and seas where he was stationed, I realize how splendidly he prepared himself to take his place as a leader when his country needed him. My uncle Henry Walker, Jr., was stationed on the Missouri during the surrender. When Nimitz came aboard, the loudspeaker of the 1MC said, Lieutenant Walker, your presence is requested in the wardroom. He went down to the wardroom, and there was nobody there. But soon in one hatch came Chester Nimitz and Bill Halsey. In the other came General MacArthur. He said, my God, this is history. I'm the only one here. And they come together and MacArthur had this baritone voice and he went up to Chester and he grabbed his hand and he said, Chester. And he grabbed Bill Halsey's hand and he said, Bill, and he put it together. This is the day toward which we have strived for so long. My God, Michael said, I'm the only one seeing this is history. I'm watching this. And they had a pregnant moment and they broke to go sign the surrender and Nimitz saw my uncle, and he said, oh, I'd seen your, your parents just a couple of weeks ago, and when you come through on the Missouri to Guam, you're going to have dinner with me. But Henry, where the hell are your collar bars? He looked down, and he didn't have his collar bars on. He said, we're going to wear our the uniform, is going to be the wash khakis, but we're also going to wear the insignia of our rank, Henry. Go get your collar bars. Because he got, my uncle got dressed down by a five-star admiral. <laughs> He, then Nimitz shook his hand, gave him a wintry smile, and said, I'll see you later, and off he went to sign the surrender. The next week, Missouri pulled into Guam, and my uncle had dinner with Nimitz, and they were discussing the surrender because my uncle was up on the bridge, and he could look right down, he watched everything that happened in the surrender, and he says to Nimitz, you look very calm and very cool, and Nimitz replied, oh, Henry, I was anything but. I shook so with excitement I could hardly sign my name. 
I have dozens of letters between Nimitz and my grandparents, and Nimitz wrote longingly several times about the time they spent together, quote, just the thought of the beach at Kailua and Muliwai, and enjoying charcoal steaks, walks on the beach, and swims, fills me with nostalgia. How I miss all of that. And in June 1946, he sent congratulations to my parents and grandparents, saying, for the, quote, safe arrival of a new heir. My, what a husky and healthy young fellow he is. That was me. <laughs> Nimitz's last letters, a few months before he passed, thanked them a million for your telegram of birthday congratulations and good wishes on my 80th. He had been so swamped by cards, telegrams, and letters that he had now sworn off birthdays interviews, and anything that attracted mail. In the 90s, while we were vying to bring the Missouri here, my uncle was asked, is this the fitting place for the Missouri? He said, we are struck by the symbolism of it being next to the Arizona. War's end, war's beginning, chords of history, between the two. It's so appropriate. It's the only place. If you put the Missouri any place else, you'd have to dig up the Arizona to get the same symbolism. So it's absolutely fitting. And now, it is fitting. We are here with Adam Nimitz's grandsons, Chet and Richard Lay, present with Fleet Admiral Nimitz's statue who symbolically come back to the shores that he loved so well. The chords of history have come together in this place at this time today with the Missouri and Nimitz's statue together standing eternal vigil over Missouri's fallen sister ship, the Arizona. I thank you and Chet and Richard, thank you. Chet, would you join me up here? We are honored to have you both here today. As I mentioned to Chet and Richards, uh, Richard, all this that happened back in the 40s, our grandparents were younger than we are today. And uh, I just wanted to pass one thing on to you. This is a copy of a letter that Admiral Nimitz sent my grandparents in 45 mentioning the marriage of your parents. Thank you. Thank you uh, good morning. Uh, our mother Catherine sends her regrets that she could not attend today's events. Uh, She'd love to have been here, but it's a 5,000-mile plane trip. She turns 100 next February. Um, would have been a long trip for her. Um, actually, when you're 99, five miles is a long trip. Um, she's the oldest uh, of the four Nimitz children and the only one still alive. Still lives at home, still is in good health, still enjoys life. Still knocks back a martini every night uh, when the evening, when the sun goes over the yard arm. And the selectmen of the town of Wellfleet, where she lives on Cape Cod, have recently awarded her the Boston Post cane, which every town in the Commonwealth bestows upon its oldest citizen. She accepted it with grace, but privately told the family, and I quote, you know, I really don't want that damn thing. Everyone who receives it dies. <laughs> Calls it the scepter of death, and we, we really, really can't fault her, fault her logic. Um, she always precedes her martini every night with her father's favorite toast from the old British Navy, which is, here's to a bloody war or a sickly season, which were the only avenues open to promotion for junior officers back then. She still has one living contemporary friend, and that's Roberta, Roberta McCain, Senator McCain's mother, who turns 102 in February and is still a very handsome woman. Uh, John McCain's father, Jack McCain, and our father, Jim Lay, were classmates at Annapolis in the class of 1931. Mom has fond memories of her time spent here in Hawaii in the early 20s uh, with her family while her father was in charge of setting up a, a de novo submarine base at Pearl Harbor. They rented a house at Manola Valley, and she still remembers the address, 2015 Lanahuli Drive. Uh, she remembers in particular walking uh, barefoot through a cow pasture to uh, Punahou, where she went to school, she and her brother. Um, and they had, they went, they had to dodge uh, Al thorns, which she said was have gone through boilerplate, let alone their feet. 
Uh, last winter, we rented for her the, battle, the uh, movie Battleship. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, uh, but she watched with a willing suspension of disbelief, but still cheered as the Missouri saved the world from very nasty space aliens. <laughs> our family, by the way, pronounces it Missouri because our father, a retired naval captain, was from Missouri and said it's the only way it should ever be pronounced. So I hope I'm not offending anybody here today. Um, this is our first time, Dick's and mine and Marion's and Jean's first trip to Hawaii and the first time we've sent, set eyes on this magnificent ship to Missouri. Um, the closest we've ever come was two years ago uh, in Annapolis when we viewed the newly refurbished Naval Academy Museum where they set up a diorama of the surrender scene. They have the original tablecloth uh, and table from September 2nd, 1945 and seated at the table is a mannequin of our grandfather wearing his uniform with his insignia they have this, one of the two pens used to sign this around the 50 cent Parker pen. And the background is the iconic photograph with which we're all familiar. And I was watching it and the curator, Dr. Harmon, I noticed was grinning at me. And he said, Chet, you know anything different about this photograph? And uh, I looked at it a little harder and I said, yes, you have <laughs> a certain army general is, is not present. I said, you photoshopped him out. And Dr. Harmon, <laughs> Dr. Harmon said, well, this is the Naval Academy and we can do anything we want. <laughs> I asked mom if there was anything that she'd like me to say on her behalf this morning. And this is what she said. Please tell all of you that her father would have wholeheartedly agreed with today's themes of honoring all World War II veterans and of peace restored. And to thank everyone involved in creating this beautiful statue we're going to see later on, especially Rip Caswell and his son Chad, uh, the Naval Order of the United States, the Naval Order Foundation, and the USS Missouri Memorial Foundation. And she wants to especially thank all of you in uniform, out of uniform, active and retired, who, have, who keep and have kept this country so safe. And thank you for making our family part of the celebration today. Mahalo. For those of you who uh, haven't had the pleasure of seeing the Battleship uh, uh, movie, we have them for sale in our store, <laughs> right over here. Thank you, Chet. We're indeed very excited to see the unveiling and dedication of the statue honoring your grandfather, Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, following our ceremony. The fact that we are dedicating a statue honoring Fleet Admiral Nimitz makes our next speaker especially appropriate for today's commemoration. Jeff Harding is a retired civilian employee of the Department of the Navy who's also a historian and motivational training specialist. One of his most successful and inspirational training programs focused on the life and career of Fleet Admiral Nimitz. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Jeff Hardy. Thank you, Mike. Necessity of age here, my apologies. Good morning. It is, it is an honor to be here today at the Battleship Missouri Memorial to commemorate the 68th anniversary of the end of World War II. And it is a privilege to be here today as we also honor Admiral Nimitz and his legacy. Certainly every American should be aware of who Admiral Nimitz was and what part he played in our nation's history. As he was, without a doubt, one of the greatest leaders of men the world has ever known. His career is filled with remarkable accomplishments, most notably his expertise on diesel engines, his pioneering efforts in submarines, his contributions to the development of underway replenishment, his success in leading one of the Navy's first ever Naval Reserve Officers Training Corps units, and most especially his leadership in the Pacific Theater during World War II as both Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet and Commander-in-Chief Pacific Ocean Areas. But today, I'm not here to speak to you about these accomplishments. Today, I've been asked by the staff of the Battleship Missouri Memorial to speak to you about one particular aspect of Admiral Nimitz's legacy. And that centers upon efforts he made to ensure that the peace between the United States and Japan would be a lasting peace. In looking at these efforts, one can readily see that it is the Admiral's character that truly sets him apart from many 
of the other great leaders throughout history, particularly his humble and magnanimous nature. And to me, this is what makes Admiral Nimitz one for the ages. In considering this premise, I'd like to take just a few moments this morning to travel back in time, back in time with you to four distinct places in time. The first three places we will visit highlight relevant and meaningful examples of how Admiral Nimitz so eloquently handled the role of victor. And the last place we will visit clearly demonstrates how the fruits of his labor became reality. Let me preface everything I'm about to say by crediting the likes of E.B. Potter and Brayton Harris for their fine biographies on Admiral Nimitz, as much of what I will highlight for you today comes from the pages of those remarkable works. Now let us begin our journey by first taking you back to 15 August 1945, the day that Japan accepted the provisions of the Potsdam Declaration. On that very day, Admiral Nimitz sent out a message to all the forces under his command. In this message, while he dutifully reminded the forces to keep their guard up, he also took the opportunity to order all his officers, not request, order, and I quote from E.B. Potter's biography, to conduct themselves with dignity and decorum in their treatment of the Japanese. I ask for you to consider for a moment that despite everything Admiral Nimitz had seen and been through during the war, and despite shouldering the burden of having to send countless men into harm's way, he sent out the aforementioned order immediately upon receiving notification of Japan's capitulation. I believe this high-minded act set a remarkable precedent, while it also revealed the great character of the man. Now let's move ahead a few weeks to our second destination, the actual day of the formal surrender on the USS Missouri, 2 September 1945, the place Tokyo Bay. The surrender ceremony has concluded and Admiral Nimitz has chosen to take time to go ashore for a final visit. Admiral Nimitz had been to Japan on previous occasions prior to the war. And during one of these visits, he had had the opportunity to meet the famous Japanese naval hero, Admiral Togo. Though the visit was brief, Admiral Togo made a lasting impression upon Admiral Nimitz. And it was, what, it was with this reverence in mind that Admiral Nimitz chose on that fateful day, 2 September 1945, to visit the battleship Mikasa. As the ship had served as Admiral Togo's flagship in the famous 1905 Battle of Tashima Straits. The ship had long been preserved as a monument. But upon arriving at the monument, Admiral Nimitz instantly saw the need to protect the ship from looting and possible damage. So, he immediately ordered a marine guard placed upon aboard the old ship to prevent any pillaging. Here again, through this act, we see the impeccable character of Admiral Nimitz. Now let's move forward to our third destination, Admiral Nimitz's home in Berkeley, California, sometime during the late 1950s, where he often received visitors who had played key roles in the war, to include not only former comrades in arms, but Japanese naval officers as well. And from the Japanese visitors, Nimitz learned that the famous old Japanese battleship he had visited in 1945, the Mikasa, had fallen into great disrepair and had even for a time been converted to a dance hall. To Nimitz, this simply would not do. Soon after learning this, Admiral Nimitz wrote an article for a Japanese publication in which he reminded every Japanese citizen of Admiral Togo's legacy and what it meant to their naval heritage. And then, in an act befitting of his character, he donated the fee he received for writing this article in order to help initiate an effort in Japan to restore the Mikasa to its original glory. And sure enough, this kind gesture spurred an effort in Japan that culminated in an ambitious restoration of the historic vessel, which was formally rededicated on 27 May 1961 the 56th anniversary of the battle in which the ship and its leader, 
made themselves known to the world. In his biography of Admiral Nimitz, E.B. Potter provided a poignant quote from a letter sent to Admiral Nimitz by Admiral Nagasawa, then chief of the Japanese maritime staff, in which the Admiral states, your name will never be forgotten, together with Togo and Mikasa in the history of the Japanese Navy. It may interest you to know that Admiral Nimitz's efforts to ensure the preservation of the Mikasa live on to this day as the crew of the United States aircraft carrier USS Nimitz has, on occasion, participated in continuing preservation efforts on the Mikasa. Finally, let me take you today to the fourth and final place we will visit, Fredericksburg, Texas, the birthplace of the Admiral Nimitz, the birthplace of Admiral Nimitz, excuse me, and the site of the Nimitz Museum of the Pacific War and the Admiral Nimitz Museum. It is worth noting here that when the concept of establishing a museum in his honor was presented to Admiral Nimitz, he would only allow his name to be associated with the museum if it honored not him, but rather all those that had served in the war with him. Today, this museum stands as one of the most remarkable museums in the world, with over 50,000 square feet of indoor exhibits. But it is an outdoor feature of the museum complex that we are here to visit, as I believe it best demonstrates the ultimate result of all the efforts Admiral Nimitz made to ensure a lasting peace. The date, 8 May 1976. It's the American Bicentennial Year. It's over 30 years since the end of World War II. And in that span of time, the Japanese people had come to deeply appreciate Admiral Nimitz's efforts in assuring the reconciliation between Japan and the United States. And to recognize these efforts, and in respect of his wisdom and generosity, a committee of formal, former Japanese officers and diplomats contributed a garden of peace to the museum. This is a phenomenal garden indeed, replete with Japanese-style plants and trees, a stream, and an exact replica of Admiral Togo's study. A plaque in the Garden of Peace reads as follows. The Garden of Peace is a gift to the people of the United States from the people of Japan. With prayers for everlasting world peace through the goodwill of our two nations. Symbolized by the friendship and respect that existed between Admiral Togo and Admiral Nimitz. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, we have come full circle. We have completed our trip through time and have arrived back at the Battleship Missouri Memorial. Hopefully our virtual trip together has illustrated for you the essence of Admiral Nimitz. Accomplished in numerous disciplines throughout his career, fearless and heroic in his leadership role during World War II, and perhaps most importantly, magnanimous in his role as victor. I believe Admiral Nimitz was one of the greatest leaders our nation and the world has ever known. Therefore, it seems to me that it is altogether fitting that the monument dedication that will take place here today, immediately after this commemorative ceremony, stand not only as a constant reminder of Admiral Nimitz's remarkable career, but that it also serve as a beacon of the lasting peace he so earnestly sought to ensure. And beyond this, let this wonderful sculpture also serve to duly inspire every new generation of individuals that visit the Battleship Missouri Memorial so that they might come to know Admiral Nimitz as we know him, one for the ages. Thank you very much. Jeff, that was fabulous. Thank you very much. The legacy of Admiral Nimitz is being carried forth on the high seas by the aircraft carrier bestowed with his name, the USS Nimitz. Just like Admiral Nimitz would have wanted his namesake aircraft carriers on duty protecting America's freedom right now. And the officers and crew are here in spirit and have provided us with a special video message to share with you from the Arabian Sea. 
I know it's a little hard to see, but certainly you can hear it, and uh, please uh, don't strain your eyes too much. Hi, I'm CTT3 Jamar Johnson from Greenville, North Carolina, Operations Department. And I'd like to say that being on board USS Nimitz has been a blessing in disguise. offices can whip up messages in no time flat. <laughs> the Battleship Missouri Memorial is committed to sharing our history and the feats of our veterans with today's younger generation. Our education program is a very important part of what we do. Our next speaker earned his way here today with the eloquence of his word in winning the Battleship Missouri Memorial September 2nd essay contest. Please welcome to the podium Colin Sitz, a freshman at Radford High School who won this year's essay contest by writing about paying tribute to our veterans. Colin? Thank you. After a long and hard fought war, Fleet Admiral Nimitz addressed the people of America, reminding them of their obligation to ensure that the sacrifice of our servicemen and women will help us make this world a better and safer place. He was referring to our veterans, but what is a veteran? To me, a veteran is a lot of things. A veteran is an upholder of freedom and peace. A veteran is one who defends and defended our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But most importantly, a veteran is someone that we owe everything to. Now, over 50 years from that fateful day above, aboard the Missouri, we ask the question, have we honored this solemn obligation to these heroes? By definition, an obligation is a binding promise that offers a sense of duty. Much like the veterans of America answer the call, we too must do our part. I find that we can accomplish this by showing how far the world has come. They say that the best way to repay your parents for raising you is to show them that you can take care of yourself. We must take this very approach and show that we are beyond violence and bloodshed. Because of them, the world has evolved into a society in which we don't need to fight. We live in a time of peace, and as long as we can uphold this peace, I feel that we can fulfill this obligation. But what more can we do to show our thanks and express our gratitude? On a nationwide scale, America has put forward many events and displays of appreciation. On November 11th, we celebrate Veterans Day, a holiday in which we praise and give thanks to our brothers and sisters, fallen and breathing, for defending our freedoms at all costs. But like the refusal to litter on Earth Day or the making of resolutions on New Year's, is it really enough to practice this once a year? You can do things every day to honor our veterans. By reciting the Pledge of Allegiance every morning, singing the anthem of our great nation aloud, you are taking pride in what they help create. By hoisting that flag, or even listening to one of their stories, you are showing compassion for the men and women who kept us going. We should perform these acts of patriotism daily and encourage others to do the same. This shows how much we care about their sacrifice to, to the nation we, they fought for. I too plan on taking part in these acts, not only because I feel it's a necessity as an American citizen, 
but also because it fills me with pride. It makes me happy when I see multiple people working together to improve the world around them. This is why I look up to our veterans, and this is why I hope when they look back they, at us, they smile. Thank you again to our servicemen and servicewomen, wherever you may reside, for defending our soil and bringing us together as one unit, one nation, the United States of America. Along with Colin, I'd also like to recognize Pauline Oncango and Fallon Villarreal, who took second and third place in the contest, and John Brandy, who received honorable mention. I'd also like to ask their proud parents and teachers to stand and be recognized, if all of them could please stand who participated in this. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is a submarine officer who has served for 35 years in the United States Navy. He's commanded the USS Honolulu, Submarine Squadron 1 and Submarine Squadron 2, as well as served as Deputy Commander of the U.S. Strategic Command. He is the 33rd Commander of the USS Pacific Fleet since Fleet Admiral Nimitz held that position during World War II. He's in charge of approximately 200 ships and submarines, nearly 1,100 aircraft, and more than 140,000 sailors and civilians. Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral Cecil D. Haney, Commander, Pacific Fleet. Well, thank you, uh, Michael, for the uh, opportunity and also for your uh, support, uh, particularly here at the U.S. Yes, uh, Missouri Memorial Association for this event, but also for all the other events that occur uh, here with the Mighty Mo. It's great to see so many here today, and I can only thank uh, all the distinguished guests that are mustered here uh, today, including Honorable Gordon England, Admiral Locklear, Admiral Fargo, fellow flag officers, general officers, the council generals that were mentioned, uh, state leaders, and especially the Lay family who, who came for their first visit here uh, to Hawaii, and uh, especially our World War II veterans and all those who have served or continue to serve in our armed forces. Good morning and aloha. Aloha. It's an honor to be here to commemorate this 68th anniversary and the ending of World War II and of course to honor the legacy of Fleet Admiral Nimitz. Here in Hawaii, we are so fortunate to have many historical memorials that remind us of the events of World War II. Behind me, we see the Arizona Memorial. It stands as a reminder of the surprise aerial attack on 7 December 1941. The day after the attack, the U.S. formally declared war on the entire Japan. A war that was raged to the Pacific for nearly four years. I've often wondered what Admiral Nimitz thought as he first toured the harbor and looked at the devastated fleet. I especially wonder what he thought when he looked at the battleship Arizona. You see, in 1938, as a new admiral, he had served on the Arizona as the commander of Battleship Division One. Of the 1177 sailors and Marines forever entombed on Arizona, Admiral Nimitz would have known some of these as his former shipmate. In the distance, we also see the Bofin Memorial, a reminder that in his early career, Admiral Nimitz spent considerable time developing the submarine community, commanding submarines and submarine divisions, and even constructing the submarine base at Pearl Harbor. And of course he did so with frugal budget and innovative solutions. In the weeks and months that followed the attack, it's no surprise that he relied heavily on the submarine force to meet the enemy as the Pacific Fleet was being rebuilt. Then here is the battleship Missouri. 68 years ago today, this mighty warship was anchored as mentioned in Tokyo Bay. 
It was on her decks that the same time of day that the instrument of surrender were signed. Can you imagine just the emotions of that historical event? As a commander of Pacific Fleet, I, of course, am honored to serve in the wake of Admiral Nimitz. In this job, I've had the opportunity to visit many memorials and sites of historical battles, such as Midway, Peleliu, Tarawa, Guadalcanal, and Corregidor, just to name a few. Each time, I was struck by how remote and inhospitable these places were as I imagined the difficulties of fighting to take those beaches with the crashing surf, the shifting tides, and of course the constant barrage of counterfire from the enemy. I've also been privileged to talk to veterans and hear their first-hand account of these battles and how they fought with tenacity, dignity, honor, courage, and commitment. Fleet Admiral Nimitz sent these courageous men to these remote and difficult places to fight and win so that our strategy could ultimately bring about victory. After the war, Admiral Nimitz continued to serve as the Chief of Naval Operations. And despite the inevitable force reduction that follows every major conflict, he made sure that the Navy he led maintained a continuous presence in the Pacific in order to promote security and stability in the region. This may be one of his most enduring legacies. Our presence in the Western Pacific since the 1940s has helped most of these nations grow and their economies thrive. If you could see before and after pictures of what many of these nations looked like after World War II, and then again in the 1970s, and now, it's truly remarkable how they have developed nations like Singapore, Thailand, Korea, and China continue to prosper as a result of the security and stability that we have helped provide since World War II. Perhaps no nation in the Pacific has prospered more than the nation of Japan, one of our closest friends and one of our five treaty allies in the region. Today, our four deployed naval forces and other U.S. forces in Japan work closely with the very capable Japanese self-defense force. Japan has one of the world's largest economies and one of our top economic trading partners. Today, we remain present in the Indo-Asia Pacific region, working with our allies, partners, and friends to strengthen our relationships and maintain the conditions necessary for continued growth. As we continue to rebalance in this era of fiscal austerity, I predict that once again, we will follow Admiral Nimitz's example and maintain our presence in the Western Pacific for decades, yes, decades to come. Fleet Admiral Nimitz also understood the importance of continued strategic operation and tactical development. He valued the advantages of technical advances and operational intelligence that would give our military, just as we value these today. He studied dutifully at the Navy War College where he gained an appreciation for strategic matters and tactics by studying historical battles like the Battle of Jutland. Perhaps it was due to his unorthodox career path, but he often challenged the current day naval operation approaches, even recognizing early on the utility of the aircraft carrier in unrestricted submarine operations. From his studies and experience in manufacturing diesel engines, he understood the importance of our nation's industrial base and the importance of maintaining critical shipyard repair capabilities, such as what we have here at Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. He also understood the importance of information operations and what we call information dominance today, highlighted by the decisions he made surrounding the Battle of Midway. Even when we think of today's nuclear forces, our nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers, isn't it interesting that Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz was one of the lone voices of support to then Captain Hyman Rickover's idea 
of nuclear propulsion for our warships. Very important given the vast distances our ships and capability have to travel in this Indo-Asia Pacific region. Fleet Admiral Nimitz was a humble man, and I think he'd be the first to say, though, that he had lots of help. Today, as you saw earlier when we recognized the number of veterans from World War II that are sitting in the audience today, many of these men served under Fleet Admiral Nimitz and can tell you firsthand what it was like. These patriots fought, bled, sacrificed to the end of the war and created the conditions for a lasting and meaningful peace. We can't thank them enough for their service. I want to personally thank each of you who served our nation during World War II, allowing us to commemorate this special day. Thank you, and how about another round of applause? As I conclude, I want to leave you with a quote by Fleet Admiral Nimitz that I feel remains relevant today. After the cer ceremony on 2 September 1945, Fleet Admiral Nimitz spoke of those who died in the war in the Pacific. He said, quote, they fought together as brothers in arms. They died together, and now they sleep side by side. To them, we have a solemn obligation, the obligation to ensure that their sacrifice will help make this a better and safer world in which to live, end quote. Fleet Admiral Nimitz believed that, and he set the conditions to achieve it. Today, our joint military forces are operating forward, providing our President of the United States with a range of military options responsive, agile, ready to respond when required, with sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines, and of course, Coast Guardmen, continuing to carry out the legacy of the courageous and dedicated World War II veterans. These veterans who have set us on a course to support the peace and prosperity in this vast maritime domain. May we continue to reflect and not forget what it took to get to 2 September 1945. May God continue to bless our nation and all those who have selfishly served or are serving our nation in uniform and of course their families. Aloha, mahalo, nui, loa. Thank you.
Acting Admiral, for sharing your thoughts with us today, and especially for your military service for America. And thanks also to the Pacific Fleet Band for their wonderful music today. We now wish to remember those who have given to their country and to us the ultimate sacrifice in defense of our freedom. Please pause for a moment in silence and remembrance of all fallen veterans, those of wars past and present. Yamaguchi. Please see. As our commemoration ceremony draws to a close, we'd like to thank all of you today for making today Labor Day, for coming today to commemorate this historic anniversary with us. Thank you to our guest speakers, Captain Michael Lilly, Chester nimitz Lay, Jeff Harding, Colin Sitz, and Admiral Cecil Haney. And most of all, thank you to all of our veterans, active duty servicemen, and women and their families for honoring us with your presence. If you would please, could I ask you to please stand for the benediction.
1945, about 30 minutes after the surrender ceremony began, General MacArthur closed this proceeding with words of wisdom and foresight in calling for peace. His message rings as true today as it did 68 years ago. As you listen to his closing message, I'm confident that you will agree. It's my earnest hope, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this hollow occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. Yeah, I guess those are the world dedicated to the dignity of man and the fulfillment of his most cherished wish of freedom, tolerance, and justice. Uh, I pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. With those famous words, this does indeed conclude our commemoration today. I encourage you to remain with us as we proceed with the dedication of the Admiral Nimitz statue. Following the dedication ceremony, we'll gather around the statue located behind the tent for its official unveiling. We ask you please allow today's speakers or other dignitaries to be in front rows to exit as they make their way to the statue. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the 38th Commander General of the Navy Order of the United States. and retired from the Navy after 36 years of distinguished service. Please welcome Rear Admiral Douglas Moore. Thank you, Michael. Distinguished guests, fellow flag officers, members of the extended Nimitz family that are with us today, our Naval Water Companions, ladies and gentlemen, and I'd like to stop to welcome one of our real special Naval Water members, Chief Howie Snell, one of our Pearl Harbor survivors. Howie, where are you? All right, stand up, Howie. It's my distinct uh, privilege on behalf of the Naval Order of the United States to present this statue of Fleet Admiral Chester William Nimitz for dedication on this bright and somewhat windy morning here in Hawaii. Here in Pearl Harbor, in this historic setting, just forward of the USS Arizona Memorial and adjacent to the battleship USS Missouri, the beginning and end of the war. The mission of the Naval Order of the United States is to preserve and to promote naval history. And one of the ways we do that is by erecting and maintaining monuments and more memorials to our naval heroes and naval battles. Admiral Nimitz was a product of the Hill Country of Texas. He entered the Naval Academy without graduating from high school at the age of 15. He graduated in 1905, seventh in his class of 114. He was immediately assigned to a battleship in the Asiatic Fleet, and then after several shipboard assignments, he served in five different submarines, commanding three of them in the 19, 1910 to 1920. As suggested earlier, in 1920, he came out here to Pearl Harbor and built the submarine base here. In the 1920s, he attended the Naval War College with some of his colleagues who would serve under him during the war. He was the first professor of naval science at the University of California, Berkeley. And in the 1930s had a number of command billets with ships and then high level positions and staff positions in Washington. Immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, he was hand selected by President Roosevelt to be the commander Pacific Fleet. He was uh, given the fire hose treatment, if you will, for five days, giving them all the history and the background of what was going on out here in the Pacific, and he, 
met with uh, the president and uh, CNO, uh, Admiral King, and the president said, well, go out there and, and win it for us. And uh, by the way, we have an airplane laid, laid on for you. We'll fly you out to Long Beach and then we'll put you on a PBY and you'll be out there in Pearl Harbor in, in no time flat. And he said, well, sir, I'd really like to take the train from Washington to Los Angeles so that I could study and read some of this material that they've been giving me the last week. And the president said, well, that's not a bad idea. So he and a captain that was assigned to him traveled in civilian clothes. He traveled under the assumed name he used, his wife's maiden name, Freeman. And they got on the train, went from Washington to, uh, to Chicago, and then changed to the Santa Fe Chief, which is a famous train that I think goes still from Chicago to Los Angeles. And as the train proceeded across the country, it stopped at little wide places in the road, and people get off the train and walk around a bit, and they take on some passengers and mail and whatever. And one of the protocols on the, on the train is that the porters lock all the restrooms so that they won't have any stowaways coming aboard during the stop. Well, it turned out that Admiral Nimitz was in the restroom at the time, and the doors were locked. And he, he started pounding on the door, but by then, the porter had already moved to the next car. So he was stuck in the restroom for 20 minutes, and the porter came back, unlocked the door, and the porter said, you know, you dummy, you could have you opened from the inside. He said, oh yeah, you get in there. So he, he, the porter went in the restroom, and he locked the porter in the restroom for 20 minutes. <laughs> we have to have a couple of light moments here this morning. He arrived here in Pearl Harbor on Christmas Eve, 1941. And he saw the damage that was wrought by the Japanese attack, including the USS Arizona and his flagship, the, uh, and the ship that he commanded, USS the cruiser USS Augusta. And uh, he immediately began to organize the staff, take inventory of his assets, and craft a strategic plan for the war in the Pacific. It will be probably mentioned more than once, and has already been mentioned already. He eventually commanded the largest ocean area and the most number of ships of any single commander in the history of the world. Uh, he was a strategic commander for the entire Pacific War, and uh, particularly the, the aircraft battles that, uh, aircraft carrier battles that, that we had. And in fact, in the Philippine Sea Battle, there were a total of 1,200 ships on both sides of that battle that fought that battle. And uh, Admiral, if we compare that to our 284 Battle Force ships and 68 submarines. Uh, that was a lot of ships in those days. Um, Admiral Nimitz uh, directed the war in the Pacific, and historians have concluded that he never made a single tactical error in executing his strategy in the war. He was a true time, a true wartime admiral, never content to remain desk bound, and was continually going out to the to the Pacific to where battles were still raging and going back to the mainland to consult with the CNO and, and the President of the United States. He was chosen by President Truman to sign the instrument of surrender on behalf of the United States and General MacArthur signed for the Allies. Let me speak for a moment about this statue. This statue is based on a photograph of the Admiral in February 1944 at the Battle of the Marianas. I'm sorry, the Battle of the Solomon Islands, Marshall Islands. He was wearing a wash, he's wearing a wash khaki uniform without medals or campaign ribbons other than his rank device. And the only embellishment are the twin dolphins on his belt buckle indicating that he was a submarine qualified officer. Our sculptor, Mr. Rip Caspel, Caspel took poetic justice in departing somewhat from the photograph to include the five-star rank device which he received in late 1944. And I'd um, stop and there's a wonderful story of, of he and General MacArthur were promoted to five stars at the same time. It came out in a message. And the message was received and the yeoman brought the the message into the Admiral, and, and you just didn't go down to the uniform shop to get a five-star device because we didn't have one of those then. And so one of his bosun mates made up a five-star device overnight, and the next day 
General MacArthur flew in from his headquarters in Australia. And as we all know, MacArthur was a stickler for rank and seniority and privilege and one thing or another. And uh, Admiral Nimitz met him at the, at the plane and he said, good afternoon, General. And MacArthur looked down and he saw this five-star device and he said, what the hell? And, and, and the, the Admiral Nimitz said, here, sir, here's your device. But it's kind of a point of uh, During the design phase of, of this uh, statue project, uh, Mr. Caswell immersed himself in learning everything about Admiral Nimitz, uh, reading wartime journals, examining literally thousands of photographs. He and Captain Al Serafini went down to the Nimitz Museum in, in Texas to review the thousands and thousands of photographs in their archives. And every detail of this statue was very carefully researched. The uniform is, is exactly as it was in 1944. Um, he has my hat, Al Serafini's uniform, and then uh, Admiral Tom Brown, we, we, we could, those of us that are a little younger, we couldn't find the right uniform shoes. You go on the internet today, the uniform shoes aren't the ones we had then. But uh, Admiral Brown had a pair of uniform shoes that he provided. Unfortunately, they were brown, so I had to explain to our sculptor that, that the shoes should be black. Thank you. Uh, the other detail, if you will look at his, at the ring finger of his left hand, he's missing the two distal phalanxes of the, of, the, of the ring finger. He had an accident as a young officer aboard ship. His hand was pulled into a gear, and the only thing that saved his hand was his Naval Academy ring that he wore on that, uh, on that, on that finger. The statue's pedestal is absolute black granite. It is the same granite from, that uh, is on the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., supplied by the same people. And uh, the quotation that the Admiral just uh, pointed out is uh, certainly uh, one that we should remember. They fought together as brothers in arms. They died together and now sleep side by side. To them, we have a solemn obligation, the obligation to ensure that their sacrifice will, will help to make this a better and safer world to, in which to live. Uh, Admiral Nimitz was arguably the most important American naval officer of the 20th century. His important attributes included his business, his le leadership acumen as a strategist, his sense of intricacies in the requirements of logistics, organizational skill, military requirements, foresight, ability to accept and act on ambiguous intelligence and profound facility to make changes in command structure as they were warranted. These qualities combined to establish Admiral Nimitz as the prototype of the World War II military leader and the effective wartime decision maker. Admiral Nimitz personifies the American war in the Pacific. He was a wartime admiral revered by his, the men who served under, men and women who served under him. Mahalo. It's now my pleasure to introduce Captain Vance Morrison, USN retired, the president of the Naval Order Foundation. Captain Morrison was a career naval officer for 30 years as a surface warfare officer assigned to six cruiser destroyer type ships, commanded the anti-submarine frigate USS Franklin, Francis Hammond, FF-1067, and the guided missile cruiser USS Richard, Rich, Richmond K. Turner, CG-30. He was also an intelligence and weapons system acquisition management specialist and a Mandarin Chinese linguist, and served as a naval attaché in our embassy in Beijing. Captain Morrison. Thank you, Admiral Moore. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and great pleasure to be here today for this extraordinary event and explain to you the role the Naval Order Foundation had in bringing this to pass. In 2005, the Naval Order perceived a need to create a separate nonprofit fundraising foundation under the provisions of the IRS Code 501c3. This would enable the order to solicit and receive gifts, donations, and bequests from individuals, trusts, and other foundations and corporations while providing donors of such gifts the advantage of tax deductions 
allowed for gifts to a foundation. A board of directors manages the foundation's affairs, which always are directed towards support of the Naval Order's mission, the mission just explained by Admiral Moore. The foundation's first major project was designing, fabricating, funding, and shipping, and dedicating in 2008 the large statue that commemorates the U.S. Navy's participation and sacrifices during D-Day on 6 June 1944. That statue now resides atop a prominent sand dune at Utah Beach in Normandy, France. Previously, there had been no marker anywhere that commemorated U.S. Navy's D-Day contributions. The Foundation's next project was a wayside marker, similar to the information markers that will be next to the statue on the pier, near the pier, that explained the role that Commodore John Barry played in establishing the U.S. Navy. That marker was dedicated in spring 2012 next to the Barry statue at Franklin Park in downtown Washington, D.C. Last fall, a statute to honor Fleet Admiral Nimitz was first conceived when it was determined, determined that, again, no such statue existed anywhere. Admiral Moore immediately volunteered to head the project team who created the statue. The Foundation owes an enormous debt of gratitude to Admiral Moore and his team, and especially to Captain Al Serafini, for their tireless and successful efforts. It was the Foundation Board of Directors task to oversee this project and to raise and provide the requisite funding. We're proud to note that the contributions of hundreds of Naval Order companions and friends of the Naval Order were the product of persistent fundraising efforts by some of our Naval Order companions, especially, but no means exclusively, those in the San Francisco Commandery. As a result, funds were raised in time to meet each funding deadline and ultimately to fund fully the entire project. In addition, some gifts were donated in kind, particularly the significant cost of shipping the entire statue and its base from near the sculptor's studio in Oregon to here at Pearl Harbor, courtesy of FedEx Corporation and the dedicated efforts of Captain Dave Kaiser of National Capital Commander who kicked all that off. All in all, it was an extraordinary effort, especially when you consider the fact that it was only one year between the start of the project and the statue's dedication. Heartfelt thanks also are due to the USS Missouri Memorial Association for facilitating a space for the statue after a long search by Admiral Moore and his team, developing its markers, installation of the statue, and a unique venue for, as well as much assistance in planning and executing, our ceremony here today. The Missouri Memorial Association's generous, knowledgeable, and enthusiastic participation was critical to this project's success. Now, just as we here on this beautiful morning in Hawaii, when the statue is to be unveiled for the first time, millions of visitors to Ford Island in the future will be able to view a statue of and learn about the extraordinary leader of U.S. and allied naval operations in the Pacific Theater during World War II, Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz. Thank you and mahalo. It's now, it's now my privilege and honor to introduce to you the Honorable Gordon England, the 29th Deputy Secretary of Defense, the 72nd and 73rd Secretary of the Navy, and the 1st Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Prior to joining the administration of President George W. Bush, Mr. England served as President of General Dynamics Fort Worth Aircraft Company, which later became Lockheed, President of General Dynamics Land Systems Company, and as Corporate Executive Vice President, General Dynamics Information Systems and Technology Se Sector and Ground Combat Sector. His business career spanned 40 years as an engineer and senior executive. And as he comes up, I want to say that uh, uh, he's given so many speeches that he is uh, well ahead of Admiral Fargo and I. Uh, Admiral Fargo had to find a three-hole punch this morning for his speech, but uh, Gordon England, uh, he has his speech uh, 
in plastic sleeves so that if it rained or the wind blew, he'd still not lose his place. <laughs> most, most important is I'm speaking before Tom Fargo, so Tom, you're going to have to think of a lot of original things to say after all these comments about Admiral Nimitz. It is a, uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here today, see many old friends, and uh, make a lot of new friends, so uh, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. So December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in infamy, to September the 2nd, 1945, when Japan surrendered a period less than four years. Yet in that length of time, the American Navy progressed from the carnage of Battleship Row right here behind us to the largest and most powerful armada ever to sail the seas. During those 1,366 days between December 7, 41 and September 2, 45, the fleet grew from about 780 ships to almost 7,000. So America's industrial might was on the move. I might comment, by the way, uh, during this day and age, maybe the last 10 years, Admiral, I guess we build maybe 10, 12, good year, perhaps 14 ships, and some years less. So it gives you a perspective of what happened in literally uh, 1,366 days, uh, over 6,000 ships were built. New construction increased active ship levels. This was a net of losses. Destroyer escorts went up by 360, 280 new submarines, 450 minesweepers, 1,100 patrol boats, 3,600 amphibious and auxiliary vessels. The complement of officers, sailors, and Marines swelled from about 380,000, about what it is today, to almost 3.5 million. And it was having the equipment to win the fight and the bravery and determination of the greatest generation that sealed the fate of the Axis powers. Now, fortunately, the Navy and the nation were blessed with exceptional leadership and foremost, as we've heard a lot today, Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, initially Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Pacific Fleet and shortly thereafter Commander-in-Chief of all forces in the Central Pacific. His visits to Guadalcanal and Tarawa and the Marshall Islands as those battles were raging and ongoing are legendary. At Guadalcanal, while the fighting was continuing near Henderson Field, he visited General Vandergriff and his brave Marines. One Marine was catching a quick nap and was wakened by his buddy who said, Can you believe it? The old man is right here visiting with us. As you heard, he commanded, Admiral Nimitz commanded the largest ocean area in most ships of any commander in the history of the world. He was a strategic commander of the entire Pacific area for almost the entire war. He was a strategic decision maker for major historical battles, including the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Battle of Midway, the Battle of Eastern Solomons, the Battle of Santa Cruz, and the Battle of the Philippine Sea. With his supportive family, Admiral Nimitz made a smooth trans transition to civilian life. First, he was the Chief of Naval Operations, the CNO, for two years. He was an ardent champion of the Navy as he oversaw the demobilization, and he worked towards the structure of the Navy and the various branches within the DOD as the National Security Act of 1947 was implemented. He advocated for the Navy to share responsibility with the Air Force for delivering atomic weapons, resulting in submarines and aircraft carriers as key players still today in the nation's nuclear arsenal. When he left active, when he left active duty in 1947, he settled in Berkeley, California, and he became a gentleman, a gentleman, a gentleman gardener but not for long. 
Surely, tired of guarding and attending VIP events, he accepted a position with the United Nations as a plebiscite administrator for Kashmir, the area hotly contested, and still hotly contested, between Pakistan and India. When neither country agreed to a vote, nor at his subsequent attempts at arbitration, he returned to Berkeley in the early spring of 1950, although he continued to serve as a roaming ambassador for the United Nations for another two years. As you heard, in his later years, while he remained grimly indignant about the atrocity visit upon Allied personnel during World War II, he continued to respect the Japanese as a people and particularly appreciated their naval heritage. And as you heard earlier, he encouraged their preservation and worked actively to preserve the battleship Mikasa, the flagship at the uh, Battle of Tsushima, and also Togo's home, which he had visited in 1934. In summary, Admiral Nimitz personified the American war in the Pacific. He was a wartime admiral, revered by the men who served under him. He was particularly fond of a poem written from the perspective of an enlisted man. Each verse started with me and Halsey and Nimitz before concluding. We're warning them never to start it again for we've got a country with millions of men like Nimitz and Halsey and me. So I thank you all for being here today. It's a delight for me to be here. For all the veterans, I want to thank you for your service. For all those who serve today, who stand to watch, God bless you for your great service. And especially, God bless all of those who gave their lives so that we could live in freedom. Thank you all. God bless you all. Our last speaker this morning is Admiral Thomas Fargo, USN, retired, who was the 29th U.S. Pacific Fleet Commander, the same command held by Admiral Nimitz throughout the war. Graduated from the Naval Academy in June of 1970, he trained in Joint Naval, joint naval and Submarine Commands and served in a variety of sea and shore assignments. At sea, his five assignments included both the attack, both attack and ballistic missile submarines, included as executive officer USS Plunger SSN-593 and commanding officer of the USS Salt Lake City SSN-716. He served as commander of submarine group 7, commander task force 74, commander task force 157 in the Western Pacific, Indian Ocean and Arabian Gulf. He commanded the US 5th Fleet and the Naval Forces in the Central Command during two years of the contingency operations in Iraq. Ashore, he served in the Bureau of Naval Personnel with the Commander U.S. Atlantic Fleet and multiple assignments in the Office of, of the Chief of Naval Operations. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Admiral Thomas Harbour. Now for those of you that are missing uh, your golf game today, we would call it a, a three-club wind out at Navy Marine right here. But good morning and aloha. And I'd like to, I'd like to say a, and add a special aloha for the Lay family, the Nimitz family. Uh, I want you to know I, I really enjoyed remarks, and I'm sure I, I share the sentiments of everybody here. So thank you very much for being here this morning. And my, my special thanks to Admiral Moore and Captain Morrison and the Naval Order and the Foundation for their spectacular work in bringing the Nimitz statue to Pearl Harbor. It's going to be a fabulous addition to Pearl Harbor. And of course, we have a number of places named after Admiral Nimitz. Admiral Lockler's headquarters behind me, a whole class of aircraft carriers. But this is different. It's much more than a fitting tribute. It'll be a catalyst for learning about leadership 
and character and perseverance that will benefit this and future generations for decades to come. At the same time, I'd like to say a few words and commend all of the Pearl Harbor historic partners, of course, Missouri, where we're at today, the World War II Valor in the Pacific National Monument, which includes Arizona and Utah, and Oklahoma and Bowfin and the Pacific Aviation Museum. You know, I've had the great good fortune to live and work in Hawaii for the past 13 years, and I can't count the number of visits out here, but all should know that these organizations and literally hundreds of volunteers have worked mightily to improve dramatically our ability to tell the story and the lessons of the war in the Pacific. The continuous energy and investment and new additions New initiatives are evident at each of these national treasures, and this is just, of course, the latest example. So all of you that are visiting, take the time to see them all, and tell your friends who are coming to Hawaii that it's an absolutely extraordinary experience. Admiral Moore provided a superb and cogent summary of Admiral Nimitz's life, and we've heard from a number of great speakers, and we thank Secretary England. It's great to be here with you again. So it seemed to me that my contribution this morning should be to reflect on some of what we have learned and will continue to learn from the manner in which Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz led our forces throughout the war as the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, Pacific Ocean Area. How he led his command and how he conducted his life. Decision making in a time of uncertain intelligence, the selection of subordinates, as the peacetime military was immediately thrust into war and the vision and strategy so essential to victory. Certainly it's had a huge impact on the maritime leaders and practitioners who followed in his footsteps. And despite the contrast to the world we live in today, my sense is that much of what we learned from studying Nimitz is of great value to present and future challenges. Now, required reading for any Pacific Fleet commander, as was mentioned earlier by Jeff, was Admiral E.B. Potter's authorized biography simply called Nimitz, a copy of which my predecessor, Admiral Archie Clemens, made sure was right on the desk in Nimitz House when I walked into that great location in Makalapa. Admiral Nimitz lived in that house from Christmas of 1941 throughout the majority of the war. The same residence currently occupied by Admiral Haney. Uh, but you know, Cecil, we were fortunate. We didn't have to live there with our chief of staff and our fleet surgeon. Professor Potter was a history professor at the Naval Academy when I arrived in 1966. He was also the author of Sea Power, a naval history, which he wrote along with Admiral Nimitz. And as you might expect, that was the textbook for our course on Sea Power at first year at Annapolis. Nimitz also died that same year, never having written a memoir or authorizing a biography. As Potter tells it, Admiral Nimitz deplored the rushing into print of many World War II officers, particularly when their relations tended to dim the prestige of other officers or stimulate public wrangling. To his friend Andrew Hamilton, Admiral Nimitz said, People ask me why I haven't written my memoirs. My answer has always been that history is best written by professional historians. The wartime military commander is likely to be too emotionally involved to present an objective picture of himself or his associates. And his prejudices might hurt the people he served with. That certainly tells you a lot about the man up front and his character. Nimitz's orders were probably unlike any before and any seen since. President Roosevelt called Secretary Knox and said, tell Nimitz to get the hell out to Pearl and stay there until the war is won, which is precisely what he did. And you've heard about the train ride. You haven't heard the full story about Lieutenant Lamar, who Secretary Knox called and said, Nimitz needs to get some rest, get two bottles of whiskey, and making sure he gets some rest. It was good he did. As we know well, those first five months in 1942 were particularly difficult and discouraging. 
the battles of Java Sea and the Sunda Strait, the fall of Wake Island and Guam, and the loss of the Philippines. The U.S. forces at Bataan and Corregidor had just been forced to surrender that May. Admiral Nimitz later remarked, from the time the Japanese dropped those bombs on December 7th until at least two months later, there was hardly a day that passed that the situation did not get more chaotic and confused and appear more hopeless. You know, the pressure on Nimitz must have been relentless despite very limited resources and really an inferior force and with the Japanese war machine at full tilt, the expectations from Washington were still very high. At one point, Nimitz wrote something, at one point, Nimitz wrote, and he wrote something to his wife every day, lamenting that he might not last in this job a full six months. But he took the heat, calculated what he could accomplish, as well what was unac unacceptable risk, and finally got a break at Midway. Much has been written about his style and dealings with both subordinates and superiors. He neither shouted nor pounded the table, but he was always clear and exceptionally candid. He was a good listener, but recognized that tough decisions were his. There's a great story about Admiral Nimitz and Rear Admiral Block. Block was the 14th Naval District Commander right here in Pearl Harbor, had been senior to Nimitz his entire career, and in fact had been a temporary, temporary four-star grade as the Commander-in-Chief U.S. Fleet. He had a lot of advice for Nimitz about how to run the war, clearly too much, because Nimitz soon called King and found a new assignment outside the Pacific for Admiral Block. Another great source of information on Nimitz and his contemporaries is the Admirals by Walter Bornman. The Admirals makes the point that the overarching requirement and selection of commanders was simply people who could get the job done, who could get the job done no matter what the circumstances. Some of the officers Nimitz inherited, he recognized has the qualities needed to deal with this determined threat to our nation. Others were clearly not suited for the demands of war. They were replaced and quickly, but generally not retired or castigated, just assigned elsewhere. And as most of you probably know, we replaced almost an entire generation of submarine commanding officers to gain a young and aggressive cadre that would take the war forward to Japan and its logistics lines. With respect to his senior commanders, he found those that he had confidence in, like Spruance, and Lockwood and Halsey, General Holland Smith and Admiral Forrest Sherman. He kept them in command or in key staff positions and he supported them, sometimes to the limits of their endurance and sometimes, in the case of Halsey, under difficult circumstances. He had to fight the people he wanted in command. Admiral King of CNO and Commander-in-Chief U.S. Fleet had equally strong opinions as to whom should lead our forces and their debates were frequent and lengthy. These choices may have been one of the greatest strengths. Admiral Nimitz learned early on that once he made a decision to put a plan in motion to take the next strategic objective, he was completely dependent on his operational commanders to employ their forces expertly and adjust as the dynamics of the battle required. He would know the outcome when they had the time to report and had the clarity of those results. Much different than today, so it was probably fortunate that he had a horseshoe pit to the side of his house and a pistol range behind his office because he needed both to think things through as he waited for those reports. This, of course, made strategy and planning of huge importance. And service rivalries, along with very strong personalities, both in the Pacific and Washington, had to be dealt with at every decision point. As Nimitz and the national leadership struggled with finding the most appropriate course of action to defeat Japan, you can't help but be struck by the candor of senior and subordinates alike in expressing their opinions. Nimitz one day tells Spruance to go see his family and get some rest so that he'll be ready for the operation against Formosa. And Spruance says, I don't like Formosa. 
Nimitz says, well, what do you like? And he said, I'd rather go to Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And despite the previous convictions of both Admiral King and Admiral Nimitz, Bruin's persuasive arguments gained Nimitz's consideration and ultimate support. Nimitz dealt with constant bickering and debate over operational organization from the Army, within the Army and the Marine Corps, as well as naval aviation. His decisions were both pragmatic and firm, and of course left many unhappy. But there was no argument about his motives. At one point, Nimitz, after calling together all his senior officers of every service, tells them, if I hear one case of a naval officer not giving required help to the Army ashore, I will immediately relieve him. There's much more to tell and certainly to learn from the wisdom and courage and conviction of this great American leader. And all here are going to help tell that story. But it's my time to turn the podium over to Rip Caswell and, and get an opportunity for all of us to view this magnificent work. So we celebrate today the end of World War II and dedicate in this hallowed sanctuary a statue of a man whose leadership made this day possible. It is our clear intent that the multitudes who cast their eyes and focus their minds on Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, his character and accomplishments will be better able to contribute to this nation. Thank you all. God bless you all. <laughs> Apropos of Admiral Fargo's remarks, there are two interpretive markers that will accompany the statue. I commend them to you. There is the iconic picture of the Admiral signing the surrender document, but I, the, the more important photograph, I think, is a photograph of Admiral Nimitz with a, a six-foot pointer pointing at a map of the Pacific area on the wall with General MacArthur, Admiral Leahy, and President, President of the United States Roosevelt listening to his, with apt attention. It's a wonderful, wonderful photograph. Now we've come to that part of the program which you've all been waiting for, the unveiling of the statue. First, I would like to introduce our sculptor, Rip Caswell, of Troutdale, Oregon. He is a noted bronze sculptor who studied the art of sculpting in Italy. He has produced more than 200 bronze sculptors throughout his career, many for private and corporate entities, including notable statues of, of, of the Oregon Governor Tom McCall at the uh, waterfront in uh, Salem, the Oregon War Memorial, and the 9-11 Memorial entitled Strength of America at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. The Naval Order conducted a nationwide search for a sculpture with special expertise in facial features. Last month, I was back in Cape Cod and I visited Mrs. Lay and, and Dick and Chester and uh, I brought a picture of the face of the statue. And I came in and showed it to Mrs. Lay and she looked at it and she kind of choked back a tear. She said, that's my dad. And then she turned to Chester and said, all right, it's time for my martini. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Caswell will explain how he drew inspiration for the statue through his own family background, including his grandfather, who was a seaman aboard the seaplane tender USS Sassoon, which was the seventh ship to enter Tokyo Bay at the end of the war. His son Chad, an aspiring sculptor in his own right, assisted his father in creating the, the sculpture. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rip Caswell. I'd just like to say thank you to um, all of you who have served and continue to serve. And I'd really especially like to thank the U.S. Naval Order for giving my son and I a chance to give back, to take our passion, our, our gift that God has given us, and, and to release this into this sculpture for you. I hope that when you look upon the sculpture that you'll feel Admiral Nimitz's spirit uh, residing in the metal fabric that uh, encases him. I hope that as you look into his eyes, you'll see the wisdom, the courage, 
and, uh, and his personality. I hope as you look at the, the fabric and the clothing that he wore, that you'll understand his humility and his can-do spirit of getting the job done. I hope when you look at his hands and his pockets, you'll understand the, uh, the, the courage and strength in his fist as, there, as he is uh, looking forward into the future, making uh, his plans and uh, his strategies. Thank you. 
9年とかなですかね。